it will be propelled by a sound. Somebody say, by a sound. Watch this, a sound of prayer. A sound of worship. Come on, we may stand up as we appreciate what God is doing in this house. Remain standing just for a few seconds. This is Women's Month. This is a women's service. And it's strange that if you think in the natural, that I stand here as a male. I want to swing this whole service around and prove to you a manifestation of our theme and also our Vision 2030. The culture for this month is women. That is the culture. How do we take a culture and bring that culture into the church? But the balance that God is showing us this morning is since we believe that we are a culture in this house and we affect the culture outside of this house. So as it is Women's Month, God is calling me to speak about a woman. A woman that is you this morning. The woman which is the bride of Jesus Christ, which is the church. And as we celebrate women and the pain that women go through, and the opposition that women experience, I want to reflect on the opposition that the bride of Christ, the woman that we are experienced. But I'm here to identify that though we identify the culture of the country, we also switch the culture prophetically in the house of God because the culture that takes place here will impose the culture outside. And therefore we say the pain that the natural woman is going through, the opposition that the natural woman is going through, we as the church, which is the bride place like never before in Jesus name. Amen and amen. You can be seated in the presence of God. I have chosen not to preach to you this morning. I have chosen not to teach this morning. <laughs> I have chosen just to chat with you this morning. I thought if I must start preaching at 5 to 11, you're probably going to get out here by half past 12. I thought if I must teach to you at 5 to 11, you're probably going to get out here at 1 o'clock. So I'm just going to talk to you. The benefit of time this morning is the fact that I talk to you. Our administrator, John Lynn, indicated that each family can get one of these. This is an important leaflet that you can participate in this morning. It expresses the vision of the church 2030. So the ushers are standing ready to release this to you. I don't know when they're going to do it. Maybe after the service or each family get one of these. Read through it. You will be blessed this morning. Amen. I want to talk to you. Tell somebody he's going to talk. <laughs> Ezra, Ezra, do you want to come here quickly? Come on, come on, that side. I, wanna, I want you to run. You haven't done this in a long time. And flip. Oh, you do that flip. It's clearer than that side, isn't it? It's clearer than that side. I just want you to see. Keep your hat on. Keep your hat on. I'm doing this for a very strong purpose. I'm chatting to you. He's tapping me. He's chatting to us. I want you to see something. And many people cannot do this. I want you to see something. Just like you normally do it. We don't need music. You just come along and do it. There we go. Bless you. What I'm trying to 
Mercedes, we get to turn things upside down. We're going to make things complicated. You're going to feel like your head is sometimes at the bottom and your feet is sometimes at the top. Your system inside of you is going to wonder what the heck is going on with me. Only because God is turning stuff upside down.
the writer, sorry, John, the writer of the Revelations. Listen, you can see I've been in the book of Revelation for this whole couple of days. John the Revelator was on the Isle of Patmos and he was struck off his horse by an angel. And this is where he saw all unfolding in this vision, which is what is spread down in the end time. Revelation 1 starts with the seven churches, the candlestick. What is the Hebrew word for that? The, the Jews are not here today. That's the Greek. The candlestick, the seven candlestick. There we go. Menorah. Well, well that is how you remember it, the menorah. Now, if you, if you, if you look at the most holy piece of ornament or the ho most holy piece of, of item in the kingdom of God which is the out of the covenant, the box inside the box when, let's rather go back you know the, the outer court, the inner court and the holies of holies the holies of holies is a, is a room closed with tent there's no light in there the only light that's in there is the menorah there's no light from outside that penetrates in there. The only light, and that menorah, which is the seven candlesticks, it is made out of pure gold, not soldered together. It is carved from one solid piece of gold. The whole piece is carved out like that. Like you take wood and you form a man's head out of the wood. The menorah, the candlesticks, the seven candlesticks, is made as one item. Carved out, and that stands in the holies of holies. It is the only light that represents the churches. It also represents the Holy Spirit, the light of the Holy Spirit. But in essence, it represents the churches. Revelation speaks about the church as it starts. Revelation 12 is what I reveal to you: the fight between the dragon and the woman for the purpose of the seed, the male seed, and we get the revelation of that. And I want you to notice the bottom part of that text that says, help me to obey the commandments and obey the testimony of Jesus. This thing had me enthroned, the testimony of Jesus. We get a shift from the testimony about Jesus to the testimony of Jesus. It's heavy. I'm going to start writing a book about the apostolic and I'm going to hand this out to you. Please make notes, John Lennon. Well, the church is shifting from knowing about Jesus, testifying about Jesus, to testifying of Jesus. But now let me read Revelation 19, verse 9. And he fell off his horse, and the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. John also saw a wedding supper. You know, we are the bride. So there's a wedding supper. He saw all of this. And he added, these are the true words of God. Continue. And this, at this I fell at his feet to worship him. What's this? John is now falling at the feet of the angel to worship him. But the angel said to me, do not do it. Do not do what? Do not worship me. I am a fellow servant with you. And with your brothers. Who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Amen. That is his testimony of Jesus. Hold it, the scripture there. He fell off his horse. And he wants to worship the angel, thinking that what he saw has to do with the angel. And the angel says, don't worship me. This is the problem that the body of Christ has. We want to worship stuff that look like it is from heaven. We even want to worship angels. Yeah. I'm coming, I'm coming to a point. I'm just checking to you, remember? I will say something very profound about that. But he says, these angels are here to help the brothers. Last week the prophet said we focus so much on demons. Little do we know that we have angels on our side. Yes. Become more aware of the angels. 
angels on your side, then the demons will manifest. Yeah. And the angels are there to help the brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he says, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, so now you understand we must shift from the testimony about Jesus to the testimony of Jesus. Now I also know that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Listen, this to me blew my mind. This I have not read from another prophet or an apostle. This is what the Lord gave me. And this is going to go into a book to revolutionize the world. I'm afraid that I don't talk about Joe Mark's Boulevard and how we can influence the avenue. I'm talking about how we can influence the world. Amen. You must understand Revelation is revealing not the seventh church but the eighth church. We are the eighth church. I will leave that there for a minute to you and I will talk to you very briefly about something I released here two weeks ago, Pastor Neville, and I said that we are becoming an apostolic church. We are taking on an apostolic identity. To many that is a huge word. What is that? And I said that I have little interest to become an apostle. But for the purpose of where God is taking the church, and you are placing a demand upon my life to respond in an apostolic way. Because when you are going, you're going to break open new territories. You need to pull on me. And that that you're pulling on me for is an apostolic place. I'm not interested to be called an apostle. It's more than that. I said my function is to bring heaven down in earth. That is apostolic mandate. You are going to plan them. Hell, you are going to go into areas. God spoke in a new apostolic church the other day. You are going to go into areas that you least thought you would go into. We went on Wednesday with our ushers and our worship team and myself that led the program of acknowledging the First Nations people where we had uh, what's his name? Mohen Mohen, the chief justice of the country, speaking to the people. There were almost 400 people, 150 farmers. What the underlying issue of the meeting was, was the issue of our country, which is the issue of land. And I was leading the program and our staff ushers were ushering people in and our worship team led the worship and there's one thing that the chief justice mentioned when he got onto the platform to speak he says when he walked into this building he says that there was an anointing in the atmosphere and that gave him the liberty to speak and declare let me tell you what happened on Wednesday was a watershed moment it was on television, it was spread all over the news. That day, let me tell you something, this is apostolic and prophetic. That moment there was the birth of the solving of the problem of our land issue. That right there, that right there, there was the sea and who was at the center of it, the church. The news article says there was a great presence of the church in the place. What they must to say is that there was a great presence of the Holy Ghost in that place. There was something that was burned that day. Yes, what I'm, what I'm telling you that story. When we as New York Church people go into these territories, we are an apostolic church. We have an apostolic identity. When we step into those buildings to do what we need to do, our, our mouths are not, not even opening to speak anything. But when we step into a territory, that apostolic identity that's in our ashes, that's in our worshiping, takes possession of any spirit in the atmosphere and arrests that spirit and brings that spirit 
into what God wants to birth through the church. Apostolic identity. I also call it an apostolic culture. I also call it an apostolic DNA. And you know the essence of a DNA. But in order for you to understand how do we develop culture, how do we develop an identity, how do we develop a DNA, I will share that with you right now. Do you know that many churches do not have an identity? Think about that for a minute. So when, when that thought came to me, Tara, and I thought this will interest you, I'm just checking. When that thought came to me, the church does not have, many churches don't have an identity. When we personalize that, we say, and we say many people don't have an identity or they don't know their identity, then we normally define that people have an identity crisis. So then I put in my notes that most of the church has an identity crisis. You know what that means? They, that means they don't know who they are. And one of the, if, if you Google, what do people do that have an identity crisis? It is said whenever they step into an environment, they just submit to whatever that environment is. And that is what happens to most of the church. They come into an environment and the environment takes them over. Therefore, when you understand your identity, when you understand your DNA, when you understand the culture that you carry, whatever culture you step into, that culture must diminish, break down, and the culture that you carry, the identity that you carry, comes into that place. Let me quickly explain to you for five minutes. We always say everything is about atmosphere. Somebody say everything is about atmosphere. Come on, say it loud, everything is about atmosphere. Because a sustained atmosphere gives you a climate. I'm not going to explain too much about that. Write it down, you can go and Google this. A sustained atmosphere gives you a climate. A sustained climate gives you a culture. I said last week that it's not the vision of the church that grows the people. It is the culture that grows the people. It's important that the vision must be clear and articulated. But a culture can only kick in when there's a clear vision in place. That there is a million dollar statement. Google that, Twitter that. The culture can only kick in if the vision is clear. to my apostolic book. I'm just checking with you. The culture can only kick in once the vision is clear. It is culture that grow the people. Let me use this example for you. Mangoes, let me say, make the statement first. It is not along the soil that has to be good, that gives you a good harvest. We always lay the emphasis on the soil that must be good. Do you know what is equally and possibly more important to give you a good harvest? The culture. Because mangoes and apples don't grow in Cape Town. We have brilliant soil on the day. We have perfect soil. It will also grow here, but the harvest won't be that good. Why won't the harvest be good? Because we don't have the culture to grow good harvest of mangoes and apples. That is normally in Durban because it must be hot enough. Because Cape Town is not hot for too long. That is a powerful statement there. So 
Arthur Nicholas, Vineyards, Great Stone Road in Durban. Because the soil is just as good in Kenton as it is in Durban. But you can't take a vineyard and you plant it in Durban, the harvest won't be that good. Because it is too hot to long there and too cold here. It's not that hot in Kenton, therefore the vineyard grows better in Kenton. I'm trying to say to you, the growth and the harvest is not dependent necessarily only on the soil. It is dependent on the culture. Therefore, let me conclude this and get out of this. Therefore, here's a culture in this house. Any preacher that comes here releases seed. He is shocked at the way that seed manifests. He preaches the same word elsewhere and it manifests differently but he comes here to New York Church and he preaches the same word through the same seeds but it manifests differently. Why? Because here he is a different So the power in the seed that's been released has a better harvest at New York Church because of the Let me go back to you to tell you very quickly that the church is in an identity crisis. The challenge of the church is that the church don't know who they are. The church has an identity crisis. I formulated my own definition of what you can find in a church that has an identity crisis. The first point is that church that has an identity crisis is trying to be too cool to the people. The first point is the church today is trying to be too cool to the people. Too cool. They want to be too hot. They also don't want to be too cold. They just want to be cool enough. To get the people back. Uh -huh. yes. Revelation 2 says that God is church of Ephesus. He's spewing that church out of his mouth. Why? Because he's discovered that the church is neither hot, it is neither cold. If it was cold, he knew what to do with the church. If the church was hot, he knew what to do with the church. But here we have a church today that do not have an identity. They have an identity. Church is too cool. You're coming. The guy or the lady leading the worship is a cool dude. It's a cool girl. We think we think we can entertain people into the kingdom of God.
Revelation 2 says, I forgot the name of the church, but that particular church, I think it's the church in Panapan or something. You can just read it up. He says that that church holds the teaching of Balaam. Dear. Balaam is demonic. Balaam is satanic. Did you know that there are some churches that actually speak more about the devil than they speak about Jesus? They want to manifest the Satan forces more than they want to manifest angels? <coughs> Let me move on. Most churches try to please people today. And then, and then, and then if you are here for the first time and you're new and you're looking for a church, many people say, Oh, we go around and we just see the church that we like. Um, we, 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 we are in the area, so we thought we'll come visit this church and see if we like this church. We cannot get you to like us. We are done with your liking the church. This is the identity crisis because the pastor standing here, the worship team is standing here so that the people can like them. Ooh, I feel like preaching, but I'm just chatting. And the biggest one, biggest one, biggest one, most of the church now try to make church like it's not a church. We can have church in the coffee shop. Just sit and we chat about Jesus. Do you know what that is? It's, it's, it's in one of the churches. This church is trying to, to tolerate Jezebel. Church with an identity crisis. That thing is deep. I don't want to go over with my notes. Church, and I'll just flow over this by the love that there is among one another. Yes, by the love that there is among one another. The lack of love is an identityless church. By the doctrinal compromise, do we compromise? Do we okay sin? Do we approve if people do things wrong? No, it's okay, you know. Grace, more grace, grace, more grace. How do I identify church identity by the moral corruption or the moral prosperity in that church? How do you identify the church and this is what everybody is familiar with? The spiritual deadness of the church. And you visit a church maybe or you come from a church where you sit on a Sunday and it's worse than going to a funeral service. <laughs> it's because the church has an identity crisis and the leaders are all half-heartedly towards the vision of the church. I think it's an appropriate time for me to thank our leaders today, our pastors that we have, our deacons that we have. I'm thinking something now. I'm thinking something now, Pastor Devo. Often leaders are always on to what must I do? We must always look at what they must not do more than what they must do. I know the biggest thing is they must pray. But the greatest thing that we have in our leaders is that they're all loyal to leadership. Because if you have disloyalty, the birth of what we're supposed to give birth to cannot come from. Let me, let me come to the point that I'm trying to make. Let me come to the point. What is the last, you want to bring up the last scripture again? Revelation 19 verse 9. It says, and I fell to, he fell to his feet and worshipped him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and you are of your and of your brethren who have testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy Revelation 12 it says that 
the dragon now turned his attention to the earth where there are fellow men of God, women of God, sons and daughters, I define in my own language, that live according to the commandment, but that also obey the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ? David, you want to come to me? I'm Joseph of Rensburg. Dale can speak of what I have done for him to rob him. Stand up. So you can say, that Josie, he has done this for me. And he, this, this is going to go, this is going to turn me upside down. How do we become an apostolic church? First of all, I've given you examples of what we manifest, the truth that we must bear. The most important part is what we speak. Your language will give you away what your identity is. <coughs> what is the testimony of Jesus? Church is all about Jesus is good to me. That's not the testimony of Jesus, that is your testimony. You have not spoken of Jesus, you have spoken of what he has done for you. So it's your testimony. It's not the testimony of Jesus. So I hook up with Dale, and Dale is telling Robin what I have given him. He's not telling Robin about me. He's telling Robin of what I've given him. Stand there for a minute. So most of the church today, this was deep, deep, deep for me. Most of the church today is caught up in giving testimony of themselves instead of testimony of Jesus. And we think it is great. Now it is great that we must stand here and say, Jesus has done this for me. No man could do this. Then we go, But an apostolic identity church moves away from most of that type of talking to the testimony of Jesus. Therefore, when we sing songs, most songs, John is writing songs now, most songs that we sing in church is what he has done for me. It's not who he is. An apostolic identity church moves out of that. And they speak more of the testimony of who Jesus is than what Jesus has done for me. It is great for the world to know what Jesus has done for you. But we're moving away from that. We must talk less of that and tell the world about who Jesus is. testify to what Jesus has done for you. He's taken you out of and he's put you in. That's great, but that's of the past. You have to say, do you know Jesus? Do you know that he's died for you? That he's risen for you? And you're now free from sin. You must stop testifying about Jesus, about who he is, not just about what he has done for you. He's shifting about the testimony of what he has done for you. And now I'm going to close. Because that's all I had to chat with you about. But there's one thing left. left. The testimony of, of Jesus. Not the testimony about Jesus. Look what Acts 1 verse 8 says. Bring it up on the screen for me. 
Check this out. <laughs> and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Whose witnesses? The power is not for you to do stuff. The power of the Holy Spirit inside of you is to be a testimony of Jesus, and therefore they miss, what's the name of 
the spirit and the testimony of Jesus. Therefore they miss the prophecy of Jesus. Because they hold on to the scripture, God is not man. God is not man that he should lie. It purely identifies that though God came in the form of a flesh, he was God in the spirit. This is the challenge that we have in the church today, Rabbi. We want to be too fleshly, then we are too spiritual. Sometimes we want to be too spiritual, then we become spooky. Jesus was flesh and spirit. We've got to find the balance in the center where we project that God is not man. We connect with the prophecy of Jesus. We connect with the testimony of Jesus. Because John 1 verse 14 says, And God became flesh and walked among men. Church wants to be too fleshly orientated and too little spiritual orientated. Some other churches are too spiritually orientated and can't connect with the people. That is why the balance is between the spirit and the word. Some people have just word but no spirit. Some people have just spirit but no word. But the word ashes in the spirit. The word makes the spirit come to life. The spirit elevates the word of God. That's why we are high on word. Humanity. Do you know why most people don't make it, don't grow spiritually? It's because they are too carnally minded and don't exercise the spirit. My wife said something very profound. She's going to teach on this on Wednesday and she's going to speak on this tonight. And I'm going to come and listen myself, though I'm, I'm a woman. I'm, I'm, I'm the lady that the Bible is talking about here. She says many people have a, had a spiritual experience but their soul has not been delivered. Because what most of the church is doing is trying to stir your soul instead of activating your spirit. Because how do we get to your soul is by activating your spirit. But sometimes the spirit is so alive but the soul is in bondage. Chat it long enough. I know I've said a lot, but I want to close by getting you to connect with the spirit of prophecy and shift to be a testimony of Jesus. <coughs> Raise your hand there wherever you are right now. Raise your hand right there where you are. Let's get into the spirit because it's not by might, it's neither by power, but it is by my spirit. The church has little to do about the carnality of man. It is all to do about the spirit of God. Therefore, when we engage here, we engage you to have an encounter with God. Not to stir up your soul. But if your spirit is strong, it will bring a release of your soul. In Jesus' name. Come on. Right now, we are, I want you to pray in the spirit right now. Pray in the spirit right now. We're releasing you in five minutes, two minutes time. Pray in the spirit right now. Stir up the spirit, stir up the spirit.